right now on 5 on Your Side at 10. A weather alert for western parts of the viewing area overnight. Temperatures dropping into the 20s for some of us. Where the coldest spots will be and how long this chill lingers. Once a gem of the St. Louis skyline, now a downtown eyesore. Tonight, new action to bring the Millennium Hotel into the future. Tonight, a man accused of a violent crime spree is behind bars thanks to a hero deputy. I knew that's what I had to do to, to end the nightmare that these, this poor family was having. The training he relied on to rescue a woman and her three grandchildren. We start tonight in a weather alert. Temperatures dropping. Many of our communities north and west of St. Louis will be under a freeze warning overnight. Good evening, I'm Mike Bush. And I'm Kelly Jackson. This blast of cold air comes ahead of an Easter weekend warm up. Let's get over to Chief Meteorologist Scott Connell with the weather first forecast. You're stealing Scott. my good news. Easter weekend is going to be much warmer in St. Louis, but not tonight. Temperatures have held in the low 40s, right around 40 in St. Louis and points to the east through the evening hours. And then back to our west, we're still in the 30s. Have those clouds, they're being stubborn, but notice Kansas City down to Springfield already at or below freezing and it's in the 20s from Des Moines back to Lincoln and out into Kansas. So here's the bottom line. Our temperatures aren't below freezing now, but west of St. Louis, they likely will be dropping into the upper 20s. All of western Missouri through the Ozarks up to Rolla over to Potosi up towards St. Clair, Washington, Missouri, Warrington, then up towards Troy and Bowling Green. You have a freeze warning for early tomorrow morning. It's likely we'll see temperatures in the upper 20s as the clouds try to break up towards daybreak, especially west of St. Louis, but they will linger for the rest of us overnight. The freeze for some of us early Wednesday, especially west, and then it's brighter later in the day. We'll talk about that Easter weekend forecast in a few minutes, Kelly. We're following breaking news out of the Metro East. Collinsville police are investigating a deadly shooting on St. Louis Road. Investigators say a homeowner shot a man trying to break into his house. That homeowner is cooperating with police. The investigation has been turned over to the Madison County Sheriff's Office. New tonight, the city taking action on a decaying fixture of the St. Louis skyline. It comes just one year after a group posted haunting pictures from inside the dilapidated and vacant Millennium Hotel. Now the process to declare the property as blighted is moving forward. Five in your side's Laura Barcheski is live downtown tonight with what's next. Mike and Kelly, both of the Millennium Hotel towers have now been vacant for a decade. And Alderwoman Kara Spencer says it is long overdue time to reclaim this essential part of downtown. The 28 story Millennium Hotel was once a glamorous place filled with weddings and high profile events like the baseball writers dinner. But now it looks like this crumbling from the inside out. It is truly a shame that it has sat there vacant for as long as it's ha it has, and it's really um, fallen into disrepair and decay, um, and that is just unacceptable. On Tuesday, the Land Clearance for Redevelopment Authority briefly talked about a measure that would declare the three block area blighted and create a new path for developers and even eminent domain, but they won't vote on it until next month. Alderwoman Kara Spencer says if that vote is successful, a redevelopment package will land on her desk and be sent to the Board of Aldermen. What we're looking to do is to find a development partner uh, to develop a plan to revitalize that, whether that looks like rebuilding um, or just rehabbing, you know, I mean, that's really a conversation that we need to have with a serious investment partner. Uh, the city I, is not really in a position right now to do that work without having a partner that can really execute on the, um, on the uh, private side of things. Blight can be declared for a variety of reasons, including age and physical deterioration. I've seen properties in much better shape be determined to be blighted than this one. Gary Andres with h, &H Consulting has been fielding redevelopment requests to the owner in Singapore for 10 years, and he has no desire to sell or do anything with the property. He's very, very much an absentee owner. Uh, obviously pays his taxes to keep it, keep it in good graces. I would not be surprised if he fought the, um, the um, blighting of the property. Spencer says so far the owner has not come to the table and she has a message for absent property owners. We've had enough and we're going to take action. Andrew says both demolition 
and rehabilitation would be costly, specifically because of the proximity to the arch and asbestos inside. And now he says it's just time to see how this plays out and anything that's put here that needs to survive. And it's not going to be another hotel and it's not going to be another office building is what he thinks. Reporting live downtown, Laura Barcheski, five on your side. The St. Louis County government could soon be on the move. The county faces a deadline to repair or replace the aging Lawrence K. Roos government building in Clayton by 2028. The building lacks fire suppression sprinklers required by city ordinance. County Executive Sam Page sent a letter to the council saying it's too late to meet that deadline. He is now requesting $1.4 million to pay for a real estate broker to find a leased space as a short-term solution. According to Page, county charter requires council meetings be held in Clayton, but not to government offices. Tonight, the rescue effort following a bridge collapse in Baltimore has shifted to recovery. At least six members of a road crew performing routine maintenance on the Francis Scott Key Bridge are still missing. A large span fell into the water overnight after a fully loaded container ship slammed into a support column. Jay Gray is in Baltimore where investigators and a community are searching for answers. Just minutes after pulling away from the port, there were signs of trouble. Flickering lights, dark smoke pouring from the stack of the 95,000 gross ton container ship. The pilot issuing a mayday call, warning he'd lost power and propulsion just ahead of the vessel, slamming into a center support column on the Francis Scott Key Bridge. The iconic structure crumbling from the force of the impact. We advised the entire bridge, the entire key bridge in the harbor. A crew doing routine maintenance, filling potholes, was on the bridge as it collapsed. Two of the workers quickly pulled to safety, but after a full day of teams on, above, and below the water, frantically working to rescue at least six still missing, Tonight, they acknowledge their mission is shifting to recovery. That at this point, we do not believe that we're going to find any of these individuals still alive. 24 NTSB investigators are on site now to work through the remnants of the bridge, interview crew members and witnesses, examine the ship, and analyze data recorders, trying to piece together how and why the tragedy happened. The NTSB focuses on the facts. So we will, do, we will figure that out and be able to provide that information in the coming days. Today is far too early for that. The beginning of what will be a long and difficult process in the wake of the tragedy. Jay Gray, NBC News, Baltimore. The Baltimore port is the 11th busiest in the U.S. Right now it is completely locked down and will be for quite some time. Engineers say rebuilding the bridge could take five to ten years. Tonight, many are asking how safe are the bridges here in Missouri and Illinois. We check with MoDOT, which manages and inspects more than 10,000 bridges across the state. Officials say incidents like what happened in the Baltimore Harbor are rare, though there have been some scares here along the Mississippi. In April 1998, a tugboat rammed into the center span of the Eads Bridge, causing eight barges to break away and hit the Admiral Casino. Fifty people were hurt. In 2014, both the MLK and Eads Bridge were temporarily closed after being struck by another barge. MoDOT engineers say these situations are taken into consideration during construction. We do design for, for that potential of impact. Now, luckily, if you look over time, we haven't had that many. Uh, the first thing that occurs when we do have a strike is we close the structure down so that we can inspect it and ensure it's safe before we reopen it. Uh, on some occasions, we, we were able to work with the Coast Guard when they notify that something is loose on the river. Uh, we'd like to be more proactive, but timing doesn't always work that way. MoDOT says the biggest threat to our bridges are not barges, rather ice flows and the fact that we live in an earthquake zone. A trial is now underway for a Maryland Heights man accused of sexually assaulting a woman before killing her and keeping her body in his apartment for days. Prosecutors told jurors Joseph DeJoie gave Jackie Mitchell drugs and she died from a fentanyl overdose. His defense team says their client freaked out when he woke up the next morning and found her dead in his room. The trial is expected to last through this week. High praise tonight for a Jefferson County Sheriff's deputy. Yeah, he's been credited for taking a man wanted for a two county crime spree into custody. New tonight, Robert Townsend is here to tell us how he did it. Mike and Kelly Corporal Chris Guerin kept his cool and kept his SWAT training in mind when he came face to face with a carjacking suspect wanted for many crimes. 
Corporal Chris Guerin was on the job last Friday when an emergency sounded. We received a call for a potential robbery where an elderly female um, was attacked. Investigators say Stephen Deering first attacked a woman outside this boxing gym in Maplewood and then took off to Haven Hill Road in Jefferson County. Corporal Guerin says he was headed there when he learned Deering allegedly assaulted a second woman inside her Barnhart home and stole her car. Deering then reportedly drove a short distance and broke into another family's home. You know, this was the worst day of their lives. Investigators say the terrified grandma barricaded herself and her three grandchildren in a bedroom as as Deering roamed around their house. It looked like he broke two windows on the house. Um, the door that he ch essentially chased the family through uh, was locked. Corporal Guerin says when he got into the home, everything was quiet. The Jefferson County SWAT team member then kicked in the family's door. I knew that's what I had to do to, to end the nightmare that these, this poor family was having. And suddenly, you know, he was in the kitchen where uh, a ton of weapons were accessible. He says Deering didn't grab anything, but did surrender. Um, I gave him some direction and instruction to, to exit the house and uh, lay on his, on his stomach so that I could put him in a safer position so that I could put him in handcuffs. One of the things I initially asked him once I got him outside was, who are you? And he shouted, I am the Messiah at me. Um, and then asked if I was a demon sent to stop him. No, just a dedicated deputy doing his job. We're all people and, and we all care about each other and it was, it was a great experience to be part of something like that. Corporal Guerin says he's not the hero here. He says that gutsy grandma is. Guerin says she did everything right to keep her grandkids and herself safe during that heart pounding situation. By the way, Deering is now in jail. And a fluorescent woman who risked her life in a brutal dog attack is receiving North America's highest award for heroism. Robin Hanley's neighbor was out for a walk in 2020 when a pack of dogs attacked her. Hanley ran out of her house, yelled at the dogs and chased them away. When the dogs started attacking a second woman, Hadley once again distracted the four dogs who finally ran off. Both women were injured, but Hadley was not. Now she is receiving the honor with the Carnegie Hero Fund. I was lucky. And well, my husband had just passed too. And everybody, my girls say, dad was with you. Dad was scaring them off. Hanley was among 16 others to receive their award, beating out hundreds of other nominees.